Greetings and welcome back to our series on the parables of Jesus. We're continuing this video look at lessons that were taught by Jesus in a way that is called parables. Parables are often referred to as earthly stories with heavenly meanings. In other words, they're simple stories designed to teach a moral or a spiritual lesson. Jesus used parables throughout his ministry, and there are some three dozen or so of the parables that we find in the New Testament, and we're going to take a look at a handful of them as we go through this series. One of my favorites is called the dragnet, or the parable of the dragnet. Now, I think it's interesting for me because I have a personal connection to it that I'll share as we go through this, but it's a good story. And I think it's one that teaches not only a valuable lesson, but kind of an advanced lesson in Christianity. So with that, let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. As we mentioned a while back, Matthew chapter 13 is full of parables. There are seven different parables that are found in this section. Some of these were designed specifically for Jesus' closest disciples, but they all have some type of universal message. Jesus was developing quite a following during this time. And at this point, he was so popular that he had to find creative ways to get his message across. As we come upon Matthew chapter 13, we find Jesus sitting in a boat, addressing those people that had gathered around on the beach. And it's within this setting that we find this very simple, but a very powerful message of Jesus. We're going to be looking at verses 47 through 49. Matthew records Jesus as saying, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The parable, again, is very straightforward. The kingdom of heaven is compared to fishermen who cast a net out indiscriminately and catch as many fish as they can. Once the net is cast, it's gathered up on the beach, and they call the catch. The fishermen go through the fish. They dispose of what we might call the trash fish, and they put them back. And then they put the usable fish into containers to be taken and distributed elsewhere. This parable is special to me because when I was a youngster, my grandfather was a commercial fisherman in Florida. And I had the opportunity to go out with him a few times when I was a little guy. After getting up way early in the morning, he would go down to his boat and we would hop in. And I still remember the smell of the diesel motor as he motored out into the Indian River. And once we got out to where he suspected the fish would be, he would uh, drop the nets behind the boat. As the fish moved, they were caught up in the net. And I remember the, my favorite part about this is that he would pull the nets up by hand. And again, it was my favorite part because with each pull, you never knew what was going to come up out of the water. There would be some usable fish, the good fish, and they would be put in the fish box. And there were other times when what would be pulled up would be, well, they weren't any use to any fisherman, so they got thrown back overboard. Once the fishing was done, he took all the good fish out to the fish house, the wholesaler, and that's where he would reap the rewards of his effort. Now, back to the parable. At the end of Jesus' story, he makes a simple application. There will be a time when the angels would do exactly what the fishermen did. They would call the catch. Those who were found to be good, they'd be set apart and saved. Those who were wicked would be thrown into a furnace of fire, and that furnace of fire would be filled with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, 
I think it's important to understand that this isn't a fish story about catch and release. There are certain types of fish that different DNRs or wildlife agencies will tell you to kill because of its negative influence on the environment. Here in Maryland, if you catch a blue cat or a flathead catfish, you're supposed to dispose of it right there. And I think it's interesting that we see this parallel when it comes to the angels. You see, when the angels called evil, they disposed of it in a place where it could do no harm. In essence, the kingdom of heaven is a lot like a judgment. The righteous will be saved and the wicked will be destroyed. Let's step back a little bit from the story and take a look at what Jesus is trying to get across. What's he trying to teach to those in his day? I think Jesus is highlighting the certainty of an accountability that will end in an, in an eternal judgment. The angels were given the responsibility of doing the judging here, but let's not get sidetracked by the details of the story. Basically what he is saying to the people of his day is that the good will be protected and the wicked will be destroyed. Salvation wouldn't come from a lineage. It wouldn't come from their previous religion. It wouldn't be a one-size-fits-all. There was going to be a judgment, and there was going to be an eternity. Now, what does this tell us today? 2,000 years later, what can we take away from it? Now, again, we have to remember that, that typically... Parables were very simple stories with really one or two points to be made. And as I thought about what this point is to us today, I was reminded of a passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. The Apostle Paul writes, This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will repay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. I don't believe that it is possible to really be convinced that Jesus is our Lord and Savior without accepting the reality of a judgment based on personal accountability. We're all going to be judged by our righteousness and our wickedness. Um, now, sure, I, I believe in forgiveness and mercy. But I also believe that people will be held accountable for what they do, even within these second chances. No matter who's sitting on the judgment seat, we're going to have to answer for the lives that we have been given. We need to have faith that this can't happen. And we also need to understand and realize that this is an affirmation that it will happen. There will be a judgment and we will be held accountable for what we choose to do with our lives. Now, some thought and discussion questions. Number one, why would Jesus use this lesson so early in his ministry? Number two, what comes to mind when you think about the judgment day? Number three, how could you describe the principles of spiritual judgment to others?